Today is the pivotal class, the central class of the whole year. The word pivotal is probably more appropriate. Today's class is the center, centerpiece around which the whole course is structured, around which every other topic revolves and which pulls all of them um, together in an important respect. Uh, I sometimes start by saying that uh, uh, in preparing for this class, I'm always reminded that although sometimes I call myself uh, a Nietzschean, a Sextian, a Foucauldian, a Marxist, actually, first and foremost, I am a Heideggerian. My uh, um, thought, in a very important respect, is, I don't want to say structured around the same concerns, uh, or, or structured around the philosophy of Heidegger, but I find in Heidegger, a first of all, a deeply kindred spirit, and a deeply congenial attitude uh, uh, towards philosophy. Like, when I, st you know, when any course I teach, whenever I start thinking about the first class, sort of, how do I approach philosophy? How do I explain to people what is philosophy and why we do philosophy? The things that come to mind sound uh, 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 all too Heideggerian. So plagiarism from Heidegger or something. So, okay, so biographical introduction. Yeah, maybe uh, um, this is, this is an, a note for me for a future year when I'm going to re-listen to this lecture uh, uh, before we're preparing the course next year. Maybe I should start with Heidegger. I gave you a long quote from Sartre. I probably should start by introducing Heidegger in the first lecture, then go back to epistemology because epistemology provides actually an important background to Heidegger. Again, in this course, I am a fan of uh, interesting, unconventional introductions. Uh, logical positivism as introduction to Heidegger. I think that's appropriate uh, for reasons that um, I'll make clear or should become clear uh, by the end of today's class, hopefully. Um, uh, and then, and then, but then go back to Heidegger and and do the proper uh, 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 introduction to do the proper uh, exposition of Heidegger's philosophy. Okay. So anyway, um, like. How do we get into Heidegger? How is Heidegger situated with respect to this course? Um, so one of the key objectives, I mean, two ways to go about it. You could say one of the key objectives in this course is uh, uh, to provide this uh, picture of a contemporary scientific worldview. And one of the biggest challenges for this picture, at least historically speaking, is the Cartesian view of the world, which is why Descartes is up here with a uh, bullseye on his face. Because he is the target, and we're doing shooting practice at his face. Uh, um, because again, if you believe Descartes, and if you believe many of the philosophers who had similar views uh, um, before Descartes, for example, uh, much of Platonic, Neoplatonic, Aristotelian philosophy has uh, uh, similar um, implications. Human beings do, are actually, in an important respect, not part of this world. Well, they definitely are part of this world. In fact, maybe they are the most important part of this world. It's just that this world is separated into two different uh, subparts. One of them being the material, physical universe, and the other being soul or mind. And then, you know, in Aristotle or in Plato, even though they are part of the same world, then the mind is somehow above and beyond the material world, not determined by the material world, but in the final analysis, it is the material world which is determined by the mind. But in any case, in any case, you have this, going back to the ancient Greeks, you have this separation between mind and body. And this, again, in the Western tradition, this is most clearly associated with René Descartes. And for Descartes, if you start philosophy the way Descartes starts philosophy, by postulating that human beings are rational uh, subjects in the world of these external material objects, um, you get this unbridgeable gap, and it becomes unclear. How do people fit in to this reality? How, what is our place? How do we fit in? We, we seem, for Descartes, to not be determined by the laws of physics. How is that supposed to work? We have some like, free will. Um, but also, um, on the other hand, um, Yeah, of course, yes. So we're not determined by the laws of physics, but on the other hand, we have all these epistemological puzzles. How do we know that the external world exists? How do we know that our thought resembles the external world? How do we know that we can trust our perceptions? How do we know what other people think? So all, all this skeptical stuff 
And um, again, one of the centerpieces of, Descartes, of the Cartesian philosophy, and again, the reason why Descartes is up there on the board is because there's this great Chinese wall between me, myself, as this solipsistic uh, uh, subject locked into, you know, trapped behind a Chinese wall of my own mind, and everything else is on the outside. And I am in this problematic and potentially conflictual relation uh, to the whole world around me. So we want to battle with this, why don't you battle with this picture? Why? Because it goes against the grain of, uh, of the unity of science, which I have presented in the first class as this letter going from the basic um, physical stuff, so uh, physics, bi uh, chemistry, biology, psychology, all this uh, uh, um, picture that, that asserts the unity of science. There are no separations, there's only one world, and everything obeys the same laws, like we talked with respect to Newton last time, you know, this uh, marker falls, and uh, the same laws governing, uh, govern um, the trajectory of the marker and uh, uh, the motions of the planets. There's only one formula, and everything is supposed to be explicable, be it the firing of your neurons, your decision to get married or to come to class today or not come to class today, and, or, 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 you know, the objects of, uh, you know, supernovas or the explosions of quasars, right? Um, that's one way to go about it. Another way is, of course, uh, the reason why Heidegger is so very interesting, because I think he cuts to the core of our question, what are we? I told you, I think a couple of classes in a row, that for Immanuel Kant, there are three more, most fundamental questions of all philosophy, of all of philosophy. What should I know? Uh, sorry, what can I know? What should I do? What can I hope for? And these three questions, Kant says, are derivative of a more basic, more important question, which is, what is a human being? When you phrase it this way, it seems that Kant is defining philosophy as a deeply human, deeply practical enterprise, and, you know, that's that's a, that's a choice that Kant makes, and a choice with which I agree. I could go on about Sorry. this. Uh, uh, can I ask you once more the third question? Uh, yeah, I think it's... it's uh, what, can I, what can I know? <laughs> what should I do? Yeah, what can I, what can I hope for? Okay. Like, what, what does the future hold? I think I think Kant, when he's asking that, he's maybe has uh, life after death <laughs> in mind, something like that. Um, anyway, I could go on, you know, in this introductory mode for ages, never going and never getting to uh, to Heidegger. So let's, let, let me let me cut to the chase. Cut to the chase. So wherever we are, we skip to Heidegger. Now, um, <laughs> one last preliminary note, already beginning to explain Heidegger. So. Um, the, the, there was allegedly, although I couldn't find a solid reference for this, so don't quote me on this, but I, I need to look into this at some point. But allegedly, there was this wonderful dispute between two great German professors of philosophy uh, of the beginning of the 20th century. One of them is Martin Heidegger, and the other is uh, virtually unknown today, Helmut Pleissner, who's a member of the Philosophical Anthropology School, well, you know, in, in, in Russia, fairly, fairly famous. And the dispute was, again, how do we go about answering this question? What is a human being? And Helmut Pleissner said, you have to begin with biology. If you want to understand the human being, you need to look at the outside. So basically, like, if I'm trying to understand what I am, I can look at the outside, like I can cut, cut away a piece of my flesh, like cut, cut off my arm, and dissect it and look, look, look at how it works, etc. But again, a look from the outside. Or, says Heidegger, <laughs> Heidegger says, no, that's not the approach. We should start not with this uh, biological sciences which come you know, much later, you know, uh, a, a, crucial, a couple of crucial steps to it. No, we have to start from the inside. We have to close our eyes, look inward, and see what it feels like to be a human being. So again, you, have, you can have the approach from the outside or from the inside. And um, uh, interesting dispute and all sorts of things you can say about this. I'm not interested in resolving it because I think that hopefully, hopefully, it doesn't matter where we start, because if our methodology is right, we should arrive at the same conclusions. If we use these two different methods and they give us diverging conclusions, that's a big problem. And many philosophers, again, Descartes included, thought that the conclusions do seem to be completely different. Again, Descartes says, I close my eyes, I see myself as a free rational subject. Or if I dissect my body, no, I see the body as a machine. I think that's a problem, that's a sign that maybe you have made a mistake somewhere along the line. But in this course, and again, which is why I'm using, in some sense, Heidegger as introduction to Darwin, I want us to see that if you do, if, if both sides do their job properly, the results align. The results align beautifully. We are talking about the same thing. And so, yes, uh, uh, incidentally, we have Heidegger in this course as introduction to Darwin. 
I want you to see how, uh, um, you know, how looking inside and paying attention to the, our actual experience disproves the Cartesian picture and uh, uh, prepares a very fertile ground for what we're later going to talk about in uh, a broadly uh, uh, Darwinian framework, which is that human beings basically, you know, are not free rational subjects, you know, in the world of material objects. No, but human beings are part of the world, deeply part of the world. Human beings are nothing but products of larger forces of biological and cultural evolution, manufactured by those forces, not to be happy or to find meaning in life or to be free, but to fulfill a certain function in the perpetuation of the logic of those systems. And uh, again, Heidegger doesn't have the full picture, doesn't have the full account, but he has a, a crucial, crucial, um, he lays the crucial foundation for, for, for the account the way I'm going to phrase it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, let's talk about this later. Okay. So deep question. I understand it's problematic. Let's talk about this slightly later. I want to. I want to get the story out. Okay. So in order to again, I pull, uh, questions are always welcome. It's just that this is a big question. We're going to have a lot of time uh, trying to do with. Uh, we're going to need uh, and we will. Anyway. So if, before we start Heidegger, I want to read you a quote. Now, is this going to be a, an, an elucidating quote? I'm not sure. But this is the quote that, biographically speaking, was very important to me. Um, it's a quote from a, another Nobel Prize winning author, William Golding, from a very fascinating book called Darkness Visible. The book, it's an interesting book, half the book deals with the story of an adolescent girl. And her name is Sophie, and many interesting things happened to her in her life. And a lot of boring things as well. But uh, uh, at this stage, what happens in the story is that her mother, di sorry, her grandmother died. And so the thoughts of her grandmother dying lead to, to an interesting monologue in her head. So let me read you the quote. It's going to be a short quote. It was at this very point that Sophie has made her discovery. The mystery of things and her grandmother dying drove Sophie in on every side into herself. She understood something about the world. The world extended out of her head in every direction but one. And that one direction was secure because it was her own. It was the direction through the back of her head there, which was dark like the night, but her own dark. She knew that she stood or lay at the extreme end of this dark direction as if she were sitting at the mouth of a tunnel and looking out into the world. When she understood that the tunnel was there at the back of her head, this image of a tunnel, dark tunnel at the back of the head, right? when she understood that the, um, that, um, the tunnel was there at the back of her head, she felt a strange kind of shiver that shot through her body and made her want to escape from it into daylight and be like everybody else. But there was no daylight. She imagined the daylight there and then and filled it with people who had no tunnel at the back of their heads. Gay, cheerful, ignorant people. And then she fell asleep. That's the quote. Again, it's not as long and as fascinating as the quote by Jean-Paul Sartre. The reason uh, I bring up this quote is because uh, in his poetic style, I think William Golding finds a very apt expression for a fundamental experience that everybody has, which Descartes completely forgot about. That in addition to our experience of you know, uh, making stuff and uh, observing things, there's also this darkness somewhere where we cannot see, somewhere here at the back of the head, so, as if a, a dark tunnel. And from this tunnel, all sorts of things emerge. And into this dark tunnel, all sorts of things disappear. And if we pay close attention to this uh, inarticulate experience of the tunnel, uh, um, we will see um, human condition in a different light. And basically, again, today in Heidegger, we're going to pay close attention to what are these things that come out of the dark tunnel. And next time, which is why I, I use Heidegger's introduction to tunnel, to, to, sorry, I use Heidegger as an introduction to Darwin, we shall go through the dark tunnel and we will see what's on the other side. And tentatively, although we cannot know this for sure, but tentatively, my assertion in this course is going to be that on the other side of the dark tunnel, we have the forces of natural selection, of biological and cultural natural selection. But this is for, this is for next time. But again, this is not a mystery novel. All uh, uh, 
uh, results are upfront. Heidegger himself would have been suspicious of this. Uh, he would not necessarily have approved uh, of me using him as an introduction to Darwin, but you know, uh, in the Foucauldian style, I like to use use, abuse, and misuse philosophers as tools in the toolbox. I think that's the best way to do justice to their thought. Okay, so next step. What is it that we find there? So I am looking, so again, again, again. See, uh, 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 in general, I think this is in some sense where one, one should begin philosophizing. You pause, you take a step back, and you look around and you ask, you ask yourself, what the hell am I doing here? What's going on? And I think the first honest answer is that, I don't know. Now, people have this capacity over, over you know, thousands of years of culture. We have come up with answers, ready-made answers. Uh, uh, and sometimes we can you know, spit out a story on the spot. But is it, is it true? Is it a true story, be it a scientific account or philosophical account or maybe religious account? Is it a true story? Are there good, compelling reasons for us to believe it? Or is it just some kind of story that we have inherited from our culture and we, that we are blindly repeating? So I, I think that the fundamental uh, uh, experience of philosophy is this experience of a, of a gap, of stopping, stopping in your tracks and just sort of being like, you know, uh, uh, what's the right phrase? Being stunned, like not sure how to proceed further. And... Um, then, sort of, you ask yourself, again, what am I? What am I doing here? And, again, a phrase that, that is Heideggerian, again, it's not, it's not a phrase by Heidegger, it's a phrase by uh, Brian McGee, although not in the dialogue that you have been listening to. He says that, that actually my fundamental experience, and again, ask this of yourself, does this sound right? My fundament, fundamental experience is that if I think, what the hell am I doing here? The answer sounds like this. I have found myself Always already. It's an interesting phrase in Heidegger. Always already. Immer schon in, 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 in German. So we emerge from the unconsciousness of early babyhood to find ourselves <coughs> always already as beings in this world, thrown into this world. And we find ourselves here, first of all, without an instruction manual. Some people will try to sell you their instruction manual, but uh, the manuals that I have seen don't come, so to speak, with a factory warranty. So, uh, uh, not sure if you should trust those instructions manuals. So we find ourselves without an instruction manual, but also we find ourselves, again, always already in this situation, and we inherit from the past, from the pa from the early unconsciousness of sorry, from the unconsciousness of early babyhood, we in have inherited all sorts of uh, predispositions. Uh, um, I don't know norms patterns, habits, all sorts of things that we have that none of us have, has ever chosen. You know, things sort of, again, that have, we have sort of, that have been, like, uh, 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 that come with us, like, from, as if, as if, sort of, what's the right phrase, like, uh, we are shipped with from the factory, so to speak. Mm. And um, that's one basic idea. And, uh, uh, um, Immediately, when you look at it this way, for Descartes, the existence of the external world and also the existence of other people is a big problem. Like, how can we prove the existence of the external world? Kant famously said that it's a scandal that nobody has been able to prove the existence of the external world. Heidegger wants to take a different approach to this. He says, no, it's actually it's a scandal that people are trying to prove the existence of the external world. As if your ticket of admission to the real world were contingent were dependent upon your solving an epistemological puzzle. Is that so? Is it, is, that, is it really true that you have to solve an epistemological puzzle before you can be admitted to the real world? No, 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 no. We are always already here. We are always already in the world, and we are also, very importantly, always already in the world with other people. Let me write this phrase again. Important phrase. Always already. Um, so before, before we can ask the question, what is the external world, uh, or what is the world of other people, 
like like you can ask this question only because you are already part of the world and have been socialized into a very elaborate world of culture and language and this enables you to propose this question again does this actually ask, uh, answer humes is this a good answer to humes skepticism or you know skepticism of sexist empiricists not exactly not exactly it's not <coughs> like it's not a knockdown argument against skepticism, and it doesn't try to be one. But it's a different way of looking at this whole picture, a different way, different way of phrasing this whole question. Again, the epistemology, asking questions about knowledge, uh, is just one thing among among many that people do as beings in the world. So, what is it? I, I, maybe, maybe this is going to be helpful, at least for me. Let's list the things that we find ourselves with. So, we find ourselves being part of the world. So, we are part of the world. But also, part of society. <coughs> also, we find ourselves with a body, and not just any body, but a body which is exquisitely attuned to the world, the body which fits the world. Again, in the sense that the air is naturally not poisonous to me, you know, the, the, the forces of nature, and again, the, the arrangement of society, the doors are uh, sort of the kinds of things that I can walk through seamlessly, that kind of thing. But also, in addition to all this, I find myself, again, this phrase, always already, I'm always already part of the world, always already part of society, but I find myself always already understanding the world. And again, understanding is a, it's a complicated word, and it has different meanings. So you could say understanding means understanding correctly, like knowing what is true. That's not exactly what uh, Heidegger means. Um, I mean, the way he phrases this, the, the, way, the, way, the way he uses this word, means that like, regardless of whether your understanding is correct or incorrect, you have the experience of knowing what this, all of this is about. <coughs> this is familiar. This is so clear. He more or less. strictly denies uh, uh, solipsism. Mm. Yeah, he strictly mm -hmm. denies. That's a very... That's a very um, What's that phrase? It's a very strong claim. I'm not making this claim. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to say that the whole way that Descartes does philosophy tries to si sidestep these issues of skepticism and solipsism. Mm -hmm. Does he have a knockdown argument against them? No. But he's trying to get you into a certain frame of mind where those kinds of questions seem kind of silly. So he assumes. Even though you cannot. So he answer. assumes that uh, solipsism is not true just for mm -hmm. convenience of his theory. No, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't phrase it this way. Again, mm -hmm. you can be a solipsist. All, all you want. You can be a solipsist all day. Uh, but <laughs> sort of Heidegger is trying to, like, what's the right phrase? Heidegger is trying to get you to see your experience in a certain fashion. Like, being a solipsist or being a skeptic is not a fundamental thing that human beings do. Mm -hmm. You have to be, like, again, uh, fairly old and fairly versed in the elaborate intricacies of our, of our culture to even be able to formulate solipsism or skepticism in an important sense. Again, in terms of your own experience, in, like sociologically or psychologically, people become skeptics as, as like, it's, it's, it's an intellectual achievement. It's not something that you were born with. And again, is this a good answer to uh, the challenge of solipsism and skepticism? No, no, it's not. But ask yourself, ask yourself, what is your experience of the world is like? Anyway, so again, yeah, let's focus on this. Uh, Maybe I'll say some more about this, but still, understand, find yourself always already understanding the world. You may misunderstand some things, and you know, it, it happens obviously. But misunderstanding is function of understanding. You have this like general inventory. You have this general categorical schema, general conceptual schema, which encompasses the whole world. It may prove in the course of your life to be inadequate in certain in certain ways, but like it is a fundamental. Uh, characteristic of our experience that we find ourselves always already understanding. Like, I'm, I'm standing here. Everything in this room is 
more or less clear. There are some things which are maybe unclear, like the 17 quantum fields, but that's that's also in a separate box labeled things which are unclear, and I have like ways of dealing with that. I have ways of understanding things which I don't underst understand. Otherwise, I mean, the uh, um, floor tiles and you guys and your pens and your devices, all of this makes <laughs> sense. It's an important, again, Heidegger wants to say that human beings in an important aspect are sense-making creatures. And again, we don't choose to do that. We don't choose to make sense of the world. And again, the way we make sense of the world is going to be uh, 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 partially determined by our biology and partially determined by our culture. Again, I am cheating a little bit because to know that something is determined by your biology or by your culture, you cannot you cannot just say that by uh, rolling your eyes inward and looking inside. This is going to be the account from next time, from looking the outside again, once we go through the dark tunnel. Uh, 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 and then there's going to be an interesting question, how do you separate things that come from biology things that come from, come from culture? But still, again, so the, 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 uh, like I write things on the board. You cannot not understand them. Like if if you look at them, you understand them automatically. You don't you don't have to do uh, work. And 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 like there's a certain like experience of passivity. You don't choose to read the words the way you read them. The words, so to speak, read themselves in your head. And again, the way you read the words is probably determined by your culture. But I can I can imagine some kind of biological example. Like if I it's a stupid example, or whatever. Like if I if I pull out from my bag a piece of rotting meat crawling with maggots, most of you will be disgusted, and you will not choose to be disgusted. But this is something that sort of is pre-programmed if you want by your biology, and it is again this is a function of understanding. You understand this piece of rotting meat as something bad, dangerous, disgusting. Again, it's understanding uh, the, the way of seeing this uh, object. But also, in addition to all of this, not just understanding. But also, very importantly, caring about the world. In some sense, again, uh, if you remember, uh, Dreyfus says in your home assignment that human beings are care. We are care. It's a strange way of phrasing it, but uh, fundamentally, that's, that's the, that the idea is that uh, we always already care about what happens to us. We always already care about the world. And we, do, and we don't choose how to care. And we cannot choose not to care. Again, like when I wake up in the morning, so I, 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 I use this phrase, the unconsciousness, like emerging from the unconsciousness of early babyhood, but also I could use the phrase emerging from the unconsciousness of uh, sort of waking up in the morning. Right? Today, today, today I woke up, emerged from the unconsciousness of deep sleep uh, during the night, and I find myself always already caring, always already caring about, let's say, giving uh, a lecture today, coming on time, you know, not looking weird or not looking disgusting, something like that. Uh, uh, and do I choose that? And again, in some sense, is this a critique of liberal tradition? To some extent, yes, this is very much a critique of the liberal tradition. Um, are humans uh, sort of rational creatures uh, choosing on the basis of utility functions? Well, uh, not exactly, because yes, you choose sometimes, like when you go to a, you know, a supermarket, but you almost all the time, if your choice is meaningful, you choose on the basis of things that you don't choose. You choose on the basis of preferences, which you don't choose, with, which are given to you. Is that, is that the same thing as utility function? I don't know. Maybe let's talk about this in the, in the seminar. Um, and so, um, what's the next? What's the next step? What's the next step? Well, a couple of things I definitely should talk about. Probably. Uh, uh, Guilt, anxiety, death, all the wonderful things in life, right? Um, so in no, in no in no particular order, in no particular order, or maybe in some particular order. I don't know. Let's start with uh, uh, temporality, because again, Heidegger's. Magnum Opus, the, his most important work is called Being in Time, Sign on Sight. And uh, the reason the book is called that, because in some sense he wants to say that being is time. Now when he talks about being, in principle, complicated, all-encompassing word, being, like uh, a category more fundamental than the term world or universe for Heidegger, all of being in all of its entirety. Uh, that's a difficult thing to talk about. And, and Heidegger, young, ambitious uh, philosopher, 
wanted to write a book about being itself. But then, in the course of his life, he realized that that's kind of hard to do. So instead, he, in some in important respect, he focuses not on being as a whole, but human being, my being. Like when I open my eyes, and all of this, the totality of my experience, is in some sense what Heidegger is talking about. And so when he says that being is time, he means my being is time. The being of human beings is time. And uh, so I find myself at the present moment where things reveal themselves to me. Things show, show, show themselves to me. And things reveal themselves as things which I understand and things which I care about. Uh, important assertion on the part of Heidegger, if there's something which I don't understand completely and don't care about completely, I just don't see it. It's an example which I think Dreyfus gives, maybe I'm forgetting, like the, the doorknob. Many of, many of you, most of you, had to turn the doorknob on the way here and uh, uh, in order to come into this room. But most of you, the vast majority of you, will not have a vivid memory of this, unless there was something wrong with the door, unless it was too tight, or unless this is a new building and sort of you're getting used to things. It's, it's not something that, like, 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 you did it, obviously, but it, like in, in some sense in, in an unconscious manner. You could have been doing something else and not paying attention to you completely. You know, like how people... Uh, uh, in a sleepy state can drive to work uh, uh, on, their, on their weekend, even though they were planning to go to a supermarket or something like that. Anyway, so in the present, the th things reveal themselves, but the present is informed by the past and by the future. If there was no past, I would not understand anything. Things would not be clear. I would not see things. And if there was no future, things would not matter. So from the past, I uh, um, get or I inherit. Well, Heidegger, Heidegger has this uh, wonderful jargon in uh, 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 in German. So in, and well, again, the word is Befindlichkeit. <laughs> wonderful word, Befindlichkeit. Uh, now, a couple words. Heidegger actually hates jargon. And it's, it's, it is a great irony of history that in order to explain Heidegger, I have to introduce this incomprehensible jargon. Uh, Heidegger wanted to restart philosophy, and he wanted to restart philosophy again um, on the level of, in line with basic everyday experience. So he, 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 he is very averse to using any technical language whatsoever. But this means that he had to invent a new vocabulary from scratch. And he uses basic German words in order to do this. Trouble is that unless you know German, it's very hard to translate. Because this word Befindlichkeit, well, literally it means befindedness. So like uh, uh, this notion that I find myself always already in the world with, uh, uh, with what? With a certain disposition. And this is one of the meanings of the, of the German word, disposition. Uh, another meaning is background. Background in the sense of you know, he comes from a rich background, or he comes from a uh, uh, w cultured background, in the sense of like your upbringing. But also, also, this word means layout. Layout in the sense of structure, meaningful structure. Like this room is laid out in front of me. It's not like a jumble. It's not a chaotic jumble of uh, just random objects. <laughs> I again, I understand this room conceptually. And all of these things, Heidegger implies when he talks about the Finnish guy, talks about the past. These are things I inherit from the past. Now, in some sense, the closest to us, and maybe the most important to us, is the notion of mood. Mood is something that you clearly, obviously, like a remnant from the past, and that you inherit from the past, but also something that you don't choose, and also, at the same time, something which is crucially important. Again, something contra uh, uh, Descartes, Something that has a crucial role in my life, which I do not choose. Like if I chose a little bit, like if I had a little, little, little bit too much fun last night, I wake up in the morning with a headache and in a terrible mood. That's going to affect the rest of my day. And this is something I haven't chosen. Something that, like, I, I haven't chosen in the sense of, like, you wake up in the morning and you find yourself in a bad mood. Find yourself in a bad mood. I cannot choose to uh, uh, sort of get into a good mood. I cannot choose to have a good mood the same way I can choose to raise my arm. Like I can choose to raise my right arm or my left arm. I cannot choose to be in a good mood in, in the same fashion. 
It's something that happens to me. I can try to do things to cheer me up, and they may or may not help. Uh, 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 things that you know, I, fi I have found in the past from experience to be uh, uh, good mood inducing or something like that. But again, there's no guarantee. And there's an important ex um, experience of passivity. Again, in an important sense, maybe, maybe that's the most important thing. Uh, why I'm talking about Heidegger and later Freud, to uh, focus our attention on uh, the wide array of things which I do not choose, in which my experience fundamentally is passive, of things happening to me. Mm. And so yeah, so 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 this is this is the past. This is the past. Um, but also, also, in the future, I have this, again, Heidegger likes etymologies, so we have this uh, uh, Latin word, pro project, so project in German. So project literally means throwing ahead, throwing ahead. And uh, uh, why this matters is because I have, I have a life plan. Now, again, you, those of you who read Dreyfus, hopefully everybody, you will remember that life plan is too mentalistic. It sounds too Cartesian. Therefore, Heidegger is, isn't actually looking about this sort of well-articulated verbal linguistic life plan, rational life plan. No, we are talking about a fundamental experience, like a phenomenological experience of planning to use your time in the future. Like, we do things with a future in view. And we, we assume that the future will exist. Ah, you see, this is horribly mentalistic. Don't assume anything. No, we no, 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 no. Mm. Uh, I'm not meaning that. <laughs> I'm not meaning this. I, I mean that uh, by the project, uh, he means that uh, we think that the future will exist and uh, we uh, plan our actions according to. Oh, that's what you do. You actually live as if you have future, but you have uh, some possibility. You don't actually realize that it's a possibility. Yet you, you do everything in accordance to so attain something. It's not your... We're in gold, but like you're intended. Yeah, well, again, complicated discussion. Uh, uh, what I want to stress is that we should not think of this mentalistically. Because if we think about this mentalistically and verbally, Descartes rears his ugly head. So what, what we are talking about is a fundamental feature of human experience, some kind of unconscious, subconscious, pre-conscious striving. Things make sense to me now because I have a future ahead of myself. I, like I, this situation right now makes sense to me because in some non-mentalistic, pre-conscious fashion, I have a future. I do things now for the sake of something that's going to happen in the future. I am driven towards the future. And this drive, I, I can try to verbalize it, I can try to make it conscious, but fundamentally, fundamentally, this drive is unconscious. And again, th so this phrase I keep saying, that things that we uh, uh, want are not the things we need. And the things that we truly need are the things that we cannot get. This phrase uh, uh, most appropriately corresponds to both Heidegger and Freud, this notion that at the basis of, at the basis of our consciousness, there is this insatiable drive. It doesn't have to be particularly intense, but there is this yearning, uh, uneasiness, maybe anxi anxiety, not exactly the wrong, well, yeah, or, 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 or anxiety uh, uh, of, uh, uh, again, striving toward the future, which, which in some sense can never be fulfilled. We can try to, well, that's, that's going to be the next step. We can try to get rid of this anxiety by preoccupying our mind with things, with particular objects, but none of the objects will actually be satisfying. And again, can Heidegger prove that? Does he have a knockdown proof that that's, uh, that that's true? Like if you buy a new car, that your life will not be complete? No, he doesn't have this kind of knockdown proof. But he says, if you look as a matter of your own experience, or as a matter of experience of people who share this intersubjective world with you, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen to us. Uh, in fact, what was this? Like three quarters of American population are uh, at some point in their life have been prescribed antidepressants. Uh, does, that, does, that, does that mean something? Maybe, maybe it does. Um, so, but in the end, in the end, so even though uh, for the world to, to make sense, I, I look um, to the future. However, but in the end, in the ultimate future, there is something, there is something interesting and inevitable in the future. And this is 
my death. Which, again, uh, uh, Dreyfus goes into how it's never going never to be an actual experience in my life. Uh, death is a liminal experience somewhere uh, uh, beyond uh, the things that you do here. But still, that is a... Um, what's the right phrase? Inesc inescapable fact of existence. In some, you know, often Heidegger is called, like, again, this general project is called analytics of finitude. Analytics of finitude. Human beings are finite. Finite in time. We die. Again, do, do I have a proof? Do I have a proof that you're going to die? No. But in some important sense, this is a, a fundamental fact of our experience. Uh, that we are approaching this point, which, is, which can come at any moment, as uh, we should keep reminding ourselves. And um, death is, is going to be this final, ultimate possibility, which is going to end all of my other possibilities. But also, in addition to death, which is, which is a sort of a problematic point in the future, there's also a problematic point in the past, which is groundlessness. Because even though I find myself with dispositions, with a certain background, with a certain layout, I find myself understanding the world, caring the world, I, at the same time, cannot really give an account. I cannot give a final account of why I should approach the world in the following fashion. Like, if I care about something, like for example, if I care about giving this lecture, can I prove to myself that I should care about this lecture? And the answer is, not really. Like, in the, like imagine a nagging child asking why, 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 why. And sort of, uh, I can try to give some kind of answer. Well, this lecture is important because it's a part of my career in the university, part of my life plan. But then the child keeps asking, why is that important? Uh, why do you want to have a good career? You know, why do you want to have good friends? Why do you want to do this, this, this and that? And in the final instance, it seems that I cannot give an answer. Again, I find myself uh, uh, I, that I cannot help but care about this lecture. But can I give an account? Can I give a, like a proof, maybe? And the answer that I should care about this lecture. And the answer is no. So. Again, even though, again, things make sense to me because they have a past and a future. Without the past, I wouldn't understand things. Without the future, things would matter. Still, in the past, there's this groundlessness which tells me that actually I'm not sure if I should be doing this or maybe I should just strip all my clothes off and start running around. Again, this fundamental groundlessness, fundamental anxiety about I'm doing this now, but there seems to be no deep reason or no deep meaningful significance to what I'm doing, actually. Uh, and on the other hand, whatever I do and whatever meaning I find, in the end I'm going to die and it's all going to be for nothing. So, we are, to summarize, finite, groundless, anxious, alienated, and guilty. Uh, now, guilty, uh, guilt in Heidegger refers to experience of death. So, schuld, uh, schuld. It refers to the experience of death in the sense of, uh, when he says guilt, he means inadequacy, insufficiency, lack, in two, in two senses. So first of all, whatever I do, I will still die. And so none of my, none of my com accomplishments are going to be able to live up to that. But also, also, I experience death in a small way, in the sense that every passing moment is left behind, and I cannot, I cannot change anything about that. So like, this is like a the large death, the capital D death, at the end of my life, somewhere over there, but also the small D death, which is all of the moments of my life which I leave behind every second. And again, the, the, the shul, the guilt, refers to the uh, uh, not being able to finish any fundamental projects due to my finitude, like projects of cosmic significance due to my personal finitude, but also to this notion of the past moments having waited from, you know, run, run away from me, having escaped from me like in the past, right? Uh, all of the things I could not do in the past. I, what, all, of the, all of the things I could not have done in the past, had not done in the past, all of those knots. Um, and again, and I think to think about these things is what it means to do philosophy. And immediately an interesting idea, an interesting question is, do all people think about all of this all the time? And the answer is clearly no. So what does Heidegger want to do with this? Because again, in some sense, his whole project was to uh, imply that philosophers, again, like Descartes, because remember, Cartesian meditations, the way Descartes thinks is he is this rich noble, 
who doesn't have to work a day in his life. So he is sitting somewhere in a foreign country inside a stove, right, in a dark, warm place, without a care in the world. And he just asks himself, what am I? And I, he imagines himself as this bodily, uh, sorry, a bodiless spirit uh, floating above the world. Heidegger says, no, that's not the experience of uh, most of humans. Yeah, yeah, this is also an experience of human beings, but it's not a fundamental experience of the human beings. Like, uh, there are social conditions of being a philosopher, if you want. And this is a, an, an interesting point of contact between Heidegger and Marx. There are several. This, this is one of them. So uh, uh, I could immediately retort. So, okay, Heidegger uh, criticizes Descartes, but uh, again proposes some kind of an experience which also seems to be uh, not universal, not basic. And what Heidegger is, I think, going to reply is that we all, everybody, every single person, feels this on, on some deep, unconscious level. And in this sense, this is the fundamental experience. It's just that most people, for cultural, political, or probably economic reasons, uh, never have a chance to think about this properly. But if you do, if you do, this comes to the fore in sharper clarity. But the picture is always already there. The picture is, again, always already there for everybody. For the taxi driver who brought you to this university this morning, or for, for a young child. Again. Huh? Mm, mm, that's that's very important, very important. So of course the Greeks were not anxious. Maybe let's talk about this again. So it's, it's, it's an important thing to talk about, maybe in the seminar, but uh, or, or maybe later today. But let, let's keep this in mind. Mm, yeah. uh, so for Heidegger, is there consciousness, or everything is unconscious, or can ah, you see, in some sense, this is an irrelevant question. Of course, you're conscious. And you can have all these you know, uh, departments of neuroscience or departments of philosophy of mind who explore mm -hmm. consciousness, but like, in a fundamental way, like, what's the right phrase? Like, yes, you are conscious, but your consciousness comes like one step too late. Your consciousness is consciousness of this structure which precedes your consciousness and which consciousness and which structures your consciousness. So in some sense, like, is this, is this epiphenomenalism about consciousness? In the sense of like consciousness does not matter. In some sense, maybe yes. Yeah. This is this is the picture that shows to you why uh, uh, you know philosophy of mind may be fun to do, but in an important respect, it is a waste of time. So you can be conscious only about uh, the past or or what? Hmm. Not sure exactly how to answer this question. Again, so obviously, again, there's a consciousness, and there, are, there there's things which you are unconscious of. And hmm, you know what? I'd love to continue this discussion, but maybe, lest we get sidetracked, maybe we should discuss this in the seminar, because I'm not sure I understand the question. Anyway, uh, uh, you see, in general, I love when people ask questions. And in general, I try to you know, pause every maybe five or ten minutes and you know, give you a chance to ask questions. Trouble is that if I do that, I, uh, the class turns into a sidetrack, to a sidetrack, to a sidetrack, and I never get to the points which I uh, uh, want. So, so let, let, let me at least get the basics out, and then we'll, then we'll see. So. Uh, Yeah, so we need to deal with this issue of authenticity. Because what I said right now is that for Heidegger, this is a fundamental experience, but then you can also, for everybody, but then you can also try to focus and think about this experience. Denken, it's a German word, it's a high, deep significance for Heidegger. And when you think about this, uh, you become authentic. When you keep this in view and when you order your life, in the recognition, when you, when you decide, you know, somewhat Nietzschean fashion, to live your life, to say yes to life, even though your actions are groundless and you will die, sort of, if you live your life in the face of these facts, you become authentic, according to Heidegger. Authentic. Authentic. Like your life, in an important sense, becomes your own. Is that a good thing? Is that a normative claim on Heidegger's part? And I think that in the last uh, analysis, Heidegger has to say, no, it's not a normative claim. Because how can he, like, is, is being authentic better than being inauthentic? I don't think that Heidegger has a, has, a, has a firm ground for making this distinction. He certainly can say descriptively that there are people who follow what he calls das Mann, uh, uh, which is uh, 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 translated into English as a strange phrase, the they. So, uh, uh, which is inauthentic existence. Uh, but then you can also try to be authentic. But one is not intrinsically better than another. 
There is no fundamental reason why you should prefer one instead of another. I think in Heidegger, ultimately, even though sometimes he may write as if he, he does have a reason to distinguish the two. So, uh, but again, counterposing, uh, uh, um, again, the experience of the philosopher with the experience of the everyday person, which is the they, uh, and again, make no mistake, most people, even the philosophers, live their lives as the they. Uh, now, again, so this is a strange phrase. What, what the heck does it mean? It means... Um, Forgetting about groundlessness and death, and just preoccupying yourself with the, not with the being, not with the ultimate questions of why am I here and what's going to happen to me, but just preoccupying yourselves with particular objects. So there's, there's being with a capital B in Heidegger, and then there's beings with a small b. So preoccupying yourself with beings rather than with being, capital B. So, um, Again, how does this work? Well, this works in the following fashion. You act in the world as if the solutions that the culture gives, our culture gives to the fundamental existential problems, as if these solutions are bulletproof, as if they're right. So you go about the world without questioning why you're doing what you're doing. And you focus not, not on this grand life project which ends in your death, but you focus on individual specific things like I want to get this car, or I want to date this guy or girl, or I want to get this job, etc., etc., as if this ultimately is going to uh, uh, make your life meaningful. And again, in both Heidegger and Freud, in both Heidegger and Freud, there's a like, recognition of the fundamental structure of human drive that, in some sense, like if you imagine uh, golf or tennis or baseball. The proper way to strike the ball is not to strike the ball, but to strike through the ball, so to speak, psychologically speaking. Uh, in the same fashion, uh, 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 your desire does not aim at the objects, but aims through the objects. Again, is this complicated? Is this convoluted? Yeah, maybe it's convoluted. Let me say this in simple phrase. You want this pair of shoes. You want them. You really think it's important and significant. And then you get them. And the next day, they're old hat, you don't want them anymore, there's something else that preoccupies you. You want this job, you want this car, you want to enroll in this university, but it's not the thing. Again, the fundamental experience of, drive, of, of the drive is more important than that. So again, I mean, in some important respect, Heidegger wants to say, I want my life to have meaning, and I want to not die. But because it's, it's impossible to not die, and it's impossible for your life to have meaning, that's why, psychologically speaking, as a coping mechanism, we decide to, 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 uh, to lie to ourselves and say, no, that's not what I want. I don't want immortality. What I actually want is I want this car, because a, a car is much easier to get than immortality. And this is, uh, uh, again, I think that Heidegger has no right to be judgmental about this. He has no right to judge people for doing this, because what can you do? This is, this is, this is a, a, a deep predicament, predicament of human existence, a deep tragedy of human existence. So if you have to lie to yourself to make your life palatable, if you have to tell yourself 15 irrational things to get out of bed in the morning, yeah, whatever floats your boat. I mean, what's the alternative? And again, Heidegger, I think, uh, very clearly has to recognize that everybody, including himself, most of the time lived like this. Like when he was doing, like when he was giving lectures on Hegel, or so, you know, Hegel's Hegel's concept of uh, uh, experience and the phenomenology of spirit. He was not conscious every second of the groundlessness and of the death ahead of him. No, he was trying to be a good, successful, charismatic university professor because he had this, you know, uh, life plan. Substituting, let's say, getting a post of the rector of the University of Freiburg for sort of substituting this goal for the ultimate goal of not dying. So it is a, like a fundamental inescapable fact of human existence. But being aware of this uh, some of the time um, is what for Heidegger makes your life authentic. I think that is authentic better? No, it's not better. But it makes your life your own at least to some extent, to some small and limited extent to which that's possible. And again, in light of all of this, Heidegger, does Heidegger have a solution? No, he has no solution to this problem. He says, the best we can do is, again, the phrase he uses is to uh, adopt a stance of anticipatory resoluteness in the face of death. We can like, live up to and bite the bullet. Um, another answer has to do with 
which is maybe part of the same answer, has to do with poetry. And um, I want to I get, get to this answer. So, <clears throat> so I, I have been talking about all this, right? And uh, uh, how does, more specifically, history and society and maybe social theory, social history, fit into all of this? Um, and indeed, Heidegger, towards the end of his life, had this notion, or, or you know, at least Dreyfus talks about it this way, that maybe this was not a fundamental experience, and maybe the Greeks did not feel groundless and did not fear death because the world made, made sense to them. Or maybe the medieval Christians did not have this because they believed in God. And is that a good answer? I'm not sure. Again, first of all, we have to look this up, because I'm not sure I, can, I'm, I'm, I would be able to give this reference in Heidegger. But ultimately, I don't think that this works even for the Greeks, Greeks because for, for the Greeks have this Antigone, this problem with the sophists, problem with the Fusis and the Nomos. Are the laws of society truly the laws of the gods? Do they truly correspond to the way of the universe? Yeah, but it is later. So then, um, mm. you reminded me in chapter from uh, the textbook, and yeah. the, like, the man okay, okay. Okay. Mm. okay, complicated question. Let's talk about this in the seminar. For now, for now, uh, uh, this, is, this, is, this, is, this seems to be the fundamental uh, uh, human experience regardless of, whether, or, of, of where you're born, in which culture. However, Heidegger says that each epoch has a certain, maybe this is a better way. Okay, so forget everything I said uh, past five minutes. Let me, let me restart. Every epoch has a way of trying to uh, help people cope with this, with all this stuff, which basically is the they, the they which is the, uh, 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 like an in inventory of coping mechanisms which the culture gives to you in order for you Again, these 15 irrational things that you have to believe in order to wake up in the morning. And again, the ancient Greeks had their mythology and had their understanding of the world, maybe in the, rooted in the Homeric ep epochs. Then, of course, Heidegger is mostly talking about the West, so let's stick with the West for the purpose of this class. Uh, the Christian Middle Ages had this uh, um, Catholic Church and Catholic understanding of, uh, of <coughs> what, what is the place of human being in the large scheme of things in the cosmos. But Heidegger says that... Um, in the 20th century, or well, earlier than that, beginning with the scientific revolution, beginning with the, with the industrial revolution, beginning with the enlightenment, a new kind of understanding emerges, and this is the understanding which dominates our world today. And this is the technological understanding. Technology is very important for Heidegger. Uh, so technology. And he's going to oppose to the technology the poetry. So poetry, the, the economy of poetry and technology. But our world is dominated by technology. This notion, and again, <clears throat> so he, he wants to say that, like, the fundamental imperative of our psyche, the fundamental, in some sense, the fundamental way we deal with the situation, which is not universal, but culturally specific to us. What do you do if you find yourself late at night thinking about your death and about your groundlessness? What you do is your, 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 your friend tells you, man, stop fucking around. You have a test tomorrow. Snap out of it. You have no time for this uh, weird, stupid, philosophical bullshit. Just stop wasting your time. Don't waste time. Do something useful. Usefulness. Productivity. Or maybe the word that, that I'm going to write on the board is efficiency for the sake of efficiency. The fundamental imperative of our culture and of our technology is efficiency for the sake of efficiency. I'm probably, I'm not sure if I'm going to get to Freud today, but that's okay, because you had Freud uh, last year, and you all know basic stuff you need to know about Freud. But uh, um, uh, one of Heidegger's important students, who's also a student of Freud, Herbert Marcuse, uh, um, actually phrased this in the following fashion, that sort of the fundamental um, imperative of our superego, if you remember what this phrase means, like the uh, norms that we inherit from our culture, is what he calls performance principle. Performance principle, meaning, again, exactly this, efficiency for the sake of efficiency, optimal performance. And... Um, uh, like this, one way to look at this, and whenever I talk about Heidegger, I always think about <coughs> Howard Phillips' Lovecraft. The, the fundamental, for Lovecraft, the fundamental emotion that human beings feel, feel is terror, and more specifically, terror of the unknown, terror of something that we do not understand. And so, in some sense, in this Heideggerian, Lovecraftian fashion, you can imagine all of human history and all of human society as trying to fill the world with artifacts, with man-made objects as much as possible, and to reinterpret 
natural objects as quasi-artifacts to try to make the world clear, understandable. Like we build cities, we go to universities in order to not feel, feel, feel this fundamental dread, this fundamental terror of the unknown. And again, so we make this artificial environment as much as possible. But also the natural environment, I said, in a, uh, we make it quasi-artificial in the sense that you go into the woods and you don't see the mystery of the forest. Again, this uh, 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 important phrase, I'll get you in a second, important phrase from the reading, something that Heidegger wants us to be attuned to, the fundamental mystery and incomprehensibility of existence. Instead of the uh, fundamental mystery and incomprehensibility of existence, what you see in the forest is not this mysterious old wood, but you see timber, timber to be harvested, and tables to be made out of it, something like that. And uh, uh, again, he has this um, so two phrases, Gestell uh, and Bestand, in, in German, meaning that we, in this technological culture, technological world, we start seeing everything as a resource, resource to be used and managed uh, efficiently, which includes uh, um, nature, but also includes other people, but also includes ourselves. So we become the wardens, the jailers of ourselves, the slave drivers of ourselves. We see our poor, wretched body as a slave to be driven, to be as efficient as possible. And you drive yourself to drink coffee in the morning and to uh, uh, stay awake until three, three, you know, three o'clock, uh, in mid, you know, past midnight, studying, 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 doing things because you have to be efficient. Again, is this like everything people do all the time? No, 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 no. But it's it's a dominant imperative of our culture. And Heidegger wants to say that in an important respect, this this dominant imperative is is uh, is a response to this anxiety. We do this in order, in order to not feel this anxiety. And uh, I'm going to take your question. In a second, what we need to do with this technological worldview is with respect to Heidegger. First of all, ask a question. Ask the question, what is the consequence of this? And what is the alternative? So I'm going to get your question, and then we'll talk about the consequence and the alternative. Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, as a student of philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, I realize sometimes that I mean, um, for example, few philosophers, I also think that are derived, uh, their investigation about the world are derived by their anxiety of determining everything they have around. So also sometimes the philosophical questions, uh, I think that starts such as the, the questions you mentioned before. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, what, what can I know? What should I do? What can I hope for? And a lot of these questions starts from an entity of uh, being oriented on the world we are moving in. So, um, I mean, not all philosophers, but a few uh, of philosophers, yeah, you can feel the entity you are describing. And, and I think that I don't really like when you can feel that um, they are trying to determine everything rationally, r sorry for my English, mm -hmm. rationally, uh, to, yeah, to try the m to make the word understandable, mm -hmm. but then is, uh, I mean, it's a fake way to understand the word, in my opinion. And, I don't know if and, I, if and, I, and I Heidegger certainly agrees with you. Heidegger certainly agrees with you. He thinks it is not just a fake understanding of the word, but he thinks it's a fatal metaphysical error at the very beginning of uh, uh, Western philosophy, which he traces back all the way to Plato. And uh, again, trying to, uh, again, does he have a knockdown argument against Plato? Well, first of all, he doesn't need to because Plato doesn't have a knockdown argument in, in, uh, in, in favor of his view. Uh, but also Heidegger, in a Nietzschean fashion, throws Platonic picture of the world into question by showing in a genetic fashion, in a genealogical fashion, how Plato's answer is actually like a, seems to be more like a coping mechanism that people come up with in order to feel better in the world rather than something which is true with a capital T. Mm -hmm. Again, thank you for, for your comment, and let's continue the discussion in the seminar by all means. Let me, let me, let me get uh, to the end of uh, what I wanted to talk about today. So, um, so again, so Heidegger sees in this technological drive to uh, efficiency for efficiency's sake, he sees a deep uh, dehumanization of the human condition. Uh, like he thinks that yes, it is an it is an answer that our culture provides, and it's an, it's an answer which is effective. It does actually function. It does actually organize societies quite well. But Heidegger thinks that at a fundamental level, it makes us deeply unhappy and deeply inhuman. And this is another important point of contact between Heidegger and Marx, because both of them will recognize this dehumanizing quality of 
if you want, you can call uh, uh, modern Western bourgeois rational capitalism, uh, um, which again dominates people, but also drives people to dominate themselves. And this is an important uh, question that we're going to uh, deal with when, it, when we get to Michel Foucault, because of course you can ask. Okay, so uh, uh, understandings of being, our understanding of being changes over time historically. But what is the account of that? What is the mechanism by which uh, uh, one understanding uh, succeeds another? And this is what we're going to need. Well, actually, both Marx and Foucault, and maybe Marx even more important than Foucault, but we're going to get there. We're going to get there. And the alternative which Heidegger gives, and this is in some sense like a side note from this place, a footnote, because, uh, well, something interesting to think about. Heidegger's own answer to this was to, and again, I read you this quote, to look at this fundamental, fundamental mystery and incomprehensibility of existence. Look at it, not try to run away from it, but relish in it, if you want. And uh, um, the way you do it is, broadly speaking, by poetry, through poetry, through a certain kind of poetry uh, in Heidegger. And um, it's his own answer. You don't have to take it. And it's a strange answer. And this answer is partly informed and partly has something in common with uh, uh, Buddhist outlook, especially the Zen Buddhist outlook, and maybe some of you will do uh, a presentation because Heidegger was actually interested in the Buddhist tradition. Again, this alternative way of looking at the world, not trying to bring the world under our domination, because this is, in some sense, this is the, the Nietzschean will to power, right? But trying, on the other hand, to let go. Again, the German word is Gelassenheit, a very important word, uh, word in, in, in Heidegger. Trying to let go. Uh, again, uh, uh, another uh, uh, analogy from the Eastern tradition is uh, the Taoist Wu Wei, if you remember, some of you may remember from last year, this concept of non-doing, concept of letting go, mm, of assuming this uh, contemplative uh, stance toward the world. And in an important respect, this is why we have to this, have this class after the last class. Because our modern, present-day technological worldview, which I seem to be very much a champion of, and I'm standing here in front of the board, you know, a couple of classes in a row, trying to show you how modern science understands everything. We have, have this wonderful bulletproof picture, picture from Protons to Presidents. Well, actually, it's important to realize that this picture doesn't really have any deep epistemological foundations. It, it doesn't have any claim to be truth with a capital T. And it's not really an explanatory picture. It's a descriptive picture at best. And anything, as Sartre reminds us, can happen in the next moment. And so, again, in some sense, I want to have this class after the last class because the purpose of the previous class was to show you that this, again, fundamental mystery and incomprehensibility of existence cannot be spelled away by modern science. You know, if anything, if anything, if you really look deeply at modern science, it makes you appreciate the mystery of existence much more. And again, I, I talked last time about unknown unknowns. Who cares about unknown unknowns? The fundamental mystery of existence is what we're after. Okay. <laughs> Uh, what exactly it means to let go? Yes, yeah, so complicated. Like, uh, Let's talk about this in the seminar. Poetic contemplative attitude uh, towards existence. Yeah, Yeah, but I think ultimately, the, Heidegger, I think, always wants to get beyond language. Using language, you could go beyond language. Okay, anyway, let's talk about this Let's talk about this in the seminar. We don't have a lot of time, but I do want to, since this is the lecture, uh, uh, I do want to uh, try to use this a uh, couple of minutes that we have left in order to sketch the general picture. So I haven't said anything about Freud, which is okay, I guess. Um, yeah, but I, maybe I should say it right now. So... Um, What do I want to do now? I want to connect this class to the next class. The next couple of classes, we're going to devote to Darwin. We're going to devote to what natural selection is and how natural selection operates in the biological and in the cultural realm. And we will see that cultural selection, sort of natural selection in the realm of culture, is not different in any interesting way and, in fact, is continuous and very much inter intertwined with biological uh, 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 selection. And, in fact, this the nature-nurture dichotomy, what is natural, what is artificial, this is a completely uh, uh, inadequate distinction. In fact, 
nature and nurture are intertwined in an uh, intricate fashion and cannot, cannot be separated in any clean uh, sense. So <clears throat> Heidegger, sorry, Freud, has a picture which is, in an in important respect, very similar to Heidegger's picture. In what is, again, what is our most important thing we're after? There's consciousness, and then there's the unconscious. Same in Heidegger. There's consciousness, and then there's the unconscious. All of these things that we inherit from the past uh, and we have not chosen. Uh, but for Freud, again, if you imagine this is an iceberg, uh, so we have part above the water, water and part below the water. So the id is wholly submerged, right? This is going to be, it's going to be my ego. This is going to be super ego. This is going to be id. Does that look right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does it, does it make any difference? Mm -hmm. It actually doesn't. No, it doesn't. <laughs> what is important is that there's a part underwater here, part underwater. Here. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, uh, uh. Mm, have you done the home assignment? You should know. Have you done the home assignment last year when we talked about this? So the id, the id. Again, I already erased this, but id refers to biology. Uh, Superego refers to culture. And ego is kind of your conscious self. You. In an important respect. So, yeah, so uh, like in quotes, this is you. I think you should be careful when saying that it refers to biology. Yeah, I should be careful, but I won't be careful because this is not this is not a this is not a course on Freud. But all of this, including everything I said about Heidegger, is a, is an oversimplification. Uh, now, what is important again for for purposes of this class, again from both Heidegger and Freud, is to see human beings again as uh, anxious, mostly unconscious products of larger force of biological and cultural evolution, manufactured by those forces in order to fulfill certain functions within the logical system. Um, and um, like, I, I guess the most important part that I want from this picture is this idea that you, you, are in a fundamental conflict with your superego and your id. That sort of, in some sense, for for Freud, and you can see a similar uh, similar issues, similar what's the phrase, similar tones in Heidegger, similar overtones in Heidegger. Like, ultimately, what we want is in some Epicurean or maybe Buddhist fashion. Just to not care about anything. This Greek word ataraxia, or the Sanskrit word nirvana. The ego just wants to be left alone. In some sense, for both Heidegger and Freud, we just want to just just be. But there are impulses coming from our biology that say, no, no, you cannot just sit still. You have to feed yourself. You have to breathe. You have to I don't know walk. So there are all sorts of desires which are biologically given. And again. Obviously, it is not completely biological, it's partly determined by culture, but it's say, mostly, mostly, by, or predominantly biological. Mostly is word, wrong word, predominantly, predominantly biological. But superego is, is also not entirely cultural. Because culture, as we will talk about a couple classes later on, in order for culture to affect you, culture has to pull on the handles which are provided by biology. Unless your biology provides certain handles on which culture can pull, Biology, uh, culture would not have uh, uh, any any uh, um, in impact on you. So this is going to be predominantly cultural. This is going to be predominantly biological. So so again, so you just want to sit there, but your like your biology tries to make you restless, tries to make you un un uncomfortable. Like your biology is like a slave driver who's poking you with a stick and forces you to move to expend energy. And on the other hand, your super ego, again, all of these norms that we inherit inherit from our culture also do the same. So this one is about, I don't know, food, sex, shelter, warmth, all these things. But, but culture, well, again, uh, spoiler alert for somebody like Marcuse, the most important imperative of the culture is be efficient. Efficiency for efficiency's sake. But also, in addition to this, be decent. Do not masturbate in public. Do not, I don't know, uh, be clean, etc., etc. So all of the, all of the uh, 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 imperatives which are given to us, sort of you know, things that which, which are associated with, with, with the word shame, shame. Uh, and in addition to all this, there's of course uh, uh, the external world. So you, the poor ego, has to somehow manage 
this conflict. So you sit there, and then there's three slave drivers, or, or actually it's not three slave drivers, it's three armies of slave drivers who are poking you with various sticks at the same time, trying to get you to move, to expand your calories. And you are tasked, the best thing that you can hope for in life is to somehow manage uh, uh, this horrible array and not, not collapse, not break down. And so in some sense, in an important sense, for both Freud and Heidegger, human psyche, human psychology, is just a set of coping mechanisms that allow us to not like have to not have a mental breakdown, to somehow get through the day. And in an important respect, both for both both Heidegger and Freud have something like uh, um, partly partly conservative political implications. Because for these guys, no political philosophy, no communism, no liberalism, no democracy is going to solve this fundamental problem. Human existence is always going to be deeply deeply problematic to us. For us, you know, we are never going to be in an important respect uh, uh, at home in the world. Well. For Heidegger, in some sense, yes, maybe poetry to some extent, although even if you do poetry, can you like do poetry 24-7? Not really, so it's only a partial solution. Um, so, like, as Dreyfus says, this is the last liberation, the last and the strangest liberation, uh, which, which is like apolitical, in some sense, anti-political. Like, the best thing you can hope for in life, as, Heide as, as Freud once said, that the task of psychoanalysis is not to make people happy, but to substitute neurotic misery for ordinary human unhappiness. And that's like to make life at least, I don't know, somewhat slightly palatable. Uh, so that's, 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 one, that's one issue. And another conservative element, so two conservative elements. Is first, the cake is a lie. Communism is not going to solve your problems. And second is that for both Heidegger and Freud, revolutions never happen in the streets. The, uh, like the results of the elections are never can never be something revolutionary. All of this change that happens in the sphere of politics, it's always epiphenomenal. Before something can change politically, there must be a deep change in the structure of our understanding and the structure of our consciousness. So, like all revolutions start somewhere uh, hidden, deep inside, uh, you know, in our of our psyche in the ways in which we understand the world, in the ways in which we care about the world. And the only meaningful change can come from there. Even though, even though ultimately, uh, uh, no change is going to bring, uh, bring um, any utopia about. But these are, these are the two sides of the coin. Um, these are the two topics, which I want to introduce. And again, this is only the beginning of the course. And we will be returning to this picture, more or less, every class uh, um, after this one. OK, so uh, I probably have to congratulate myself because I did get through all the things of the first of the first order of importance which I wanted to. So hopefully you have lots of questions and hopefully I, you find this interesting and engaging and we'll have a wonderful productive discussion during the seminar. So if you have any questions, do, do, do think of them for the seminar. Otherwise, thank you so very much for your attention. I hope this was fun once again and I'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you.